Oh, I didn't see you there. Well, you see, I know what thoughts keep you up at night. How can I be an expert leader who leads thousands of campaigns, yet my legacy is one of peace? I too have these thoughts, and through extensive research, I have uncovered the very example that you and I have been looking for. Rule theme song. The man in question today is Augustus Caesar, originally born as Octavius Caesar in 63 BC. He first donned the toga, or the Roman symbol of manhood, at the tender age of 16, and in a 47 BC, he first traveled to Hispania, or modern Spain as we know it, and he did so to fight alongside his great uncle, and more well-known Roman emperor, of Julius Caesar. However, in doing so, he was shipwrecked, stranded, and in order to reach his great uncle, he had to cross enemy territory. In doing so, he very much impressed his great uncle. Because, well, it was an impressive thing to do, and quite frankly, if your great uncle doesn't adopt you after you do that for him, then your great uncle's a Moving swiftly along, Julius is so impressed by this that he adopts Augustus, or at this time, Octavius, makes him his heir to his will, and his successor. And so begins the beautiful legacy of Augustus Caesar. I can picture it now. Togas, ferns, olive leaves, beautiful. 17-year-old Augustus Caesar was in modern-day Albania when he first received news of his great-uncle's famous assassination by the Senate and his good friend Brutus. The dead ruler's allies, many of whom still remained in the Roman Senate, rallied around the child against their power rival, Mark Antony. However, after Octavian's, or Augustus's, troops defeated him in the north, there became an uneasy alliance between the two parties. Now, in 43 BC, Augustus, Mark Antony, and a man named Marcus Lepidus formed the Second Triumvirate, a power-sharing agreement that would divide Rome's territories betwixt the three parties. However, as stated earlier, this was an uneasy agreement and treaty between Octavian, or Augustus, and Mark Anthony, and it had a rather climactic, mm, disappointing conclusion for Mark Anthony at least, when Augustus's fleet had Mark Anthony and Cleopatra pinned in the Adriatic Sea, and well, Augustus made Mark Anthony's fleet look more like this biplane, which has been sat on by Grant, rather than this boat, which hasn't been sat on at all. However, following this, Augustus found himself with a big problem on his hand. In fact, 18,000 soldiers big. Mark Anthony's soldiers, though enemies of Augustus's, were still enemies. They were still Romans. They were still Romans. They were still Romans. They were not still it. Shake her out. <laughs> Shake her out. I'm gonna rub you out. See? <laughs> rub you out. <laughs> However, Augustus was faced with a big dilemma. 18,000 men large dilemma. Because Mark Anthony's troops, though enemies at the time, were still Romans. And so after... Caesar had defeated Mark Anthony, he had the problem of what to do with these soldiers who were now no longer in service. 
He could either exile them and risk a civil war of these soldiers coming back, deluding the minds of Augustus's people and causing a rebellion, or he could displace 18,000 people and give these soldier, soldiers a home. He chose the latter, as he figured angry, just standard civilians were far easier to deal with than angry civilians with swords. He expanded the Roman network of roads. He founded the Praetorian Guard and the first postal service. He rebuilt Rome with new, grand, and practical services, such as police and fire departments. In fact, Augustus's reign was focused so much on the improvement of the homeland of Rome that, his, that it is said that his final words were, I found Rome of clay. I leave it to you of marble. How's that? That's a thinking man. Throughout Augustus's effamed reign, one thing was a constant, and that was his ability to stop and think every decision he made through very thoroughly. He would not have been able to improve Rome's infrastructure entirely, completely rebuilding the nation practically, expanding its territory nearly twofold, as well as inspiring a 100-year period of complete peace without having thought through every single decision he made. And that is what makes Augustus an expert leader, not a referent, not a coercive, not one who leads by charisma or who yells at his men, but someone who just knows what they're doing and stops and thinks before they act. Thank you, and you just got knowledge.